It's good to see everyone. And uh, if you want to, I'm going to have the scriptures on the screen as usual, but if you want to follow along, we'll be in Matthew chapter 2 in a few moments. It's good to see you. And, and again, we do want to welcome everyone, including those who are joining at home by live stream and to everyone who is here uh, in person. Um, C.S. Lewis is often well known for a number of things, but one of which is that he grew up in a um, home of, of faith, of belief, and yet as a result of a number of really bad childhood experiences that he encountered, as well as when he got a little bit older being exposed to a number of um, uh, things that were popular among intellectuals in uh, England during the time, became an atheist and uh, rather confirmed in that atheism until over a period of time he was exposed to some other uh, people and thought that ultimately brought him back around to a position of faith and perhaps made him the greatest advocate or apologist for Christianity in the 20th century. One of the books that sort of led him down the path toward unbelief, was written in 1890 by a Sir James Fraser entitled The Golden Bow, in which he argued that Christianity was basically a myth, uh, not unlike many other ancient myths uh, about uh, gods entering into the world and doing various wonders and uh, dying, rising again, some of these things that he traced out as being comparative um, to that, the, uh, the story of, of the New Testament and the life of Christ. Well, uh, that influenced Lewis quite a bit, particularly under one of the who was a fan of the advocate of its teaching. But then as, as Lewis continued on, he became a, a scholar of, uh, of literature and had a passion and focus in his scholarship often on the great legends and mythologies of the past. And the more acquainted he became with those myths and legends, the more it began to dawn on him because of his earlier experience that there was something extremely wrong with the working theory that he had been operating under and that the Christian faith and what was presented in the pages of the New Testament was actually not at all like the various mythologies that he was now a scholar and student of. And so ultimately, uh, he came around on that. And uh, one of the things that led him out, just as the golden bow led him in, was the realization that the New Testament teachings were rooted in time and place. In other words, the, the myths tended to simply be stories that sort of were written in a way that were very, very vague. They had no real particular time frame or even sometimes location other than in various generalities. But when, when you come to the New Testament, immediately you begin getting the, the names of the political powers uh, who were in authority at the time. You begin to get references to specific geographic locations and cities. And so there was a very rootedness to the story of Christ uh, and the early church uh, to history, uh, to the actual world that we are living in, and not just a fairy tale that was once upon a time in a land far, far away. As you know, as students of the New Testament, that's not the way the New Testament uh, speaks. And one of the most significant historical figures that I'm afraid that I find myself too often identifying with is a man by the name of Herod. And we read about uh, Herod in the New Testament, in the opening sections of the New Testament. He was self-designated as Herod the Great, and he was, he was brilliant in many ways, uh, imaginative. He was a builder uh, with almost uh, few rivals in the history of mankind. Uh, but he was also extremely politically gifted. He, he, he knew how to position himself in such a way as to get a leg up and continue to advance his political uh, ambitions and careers. And he was an extraordinarily ambitious man. 
Well, one of the things that happened during Herod's uh, career was that there was a, uh, a sort of a conflict between two key figures in the Roman Empire, uh, one of, uh, both of which you're probably quite familiar with. Of course, Julius Caesar was, you, you remember in high school or college when you read about Julius Caesar and how he was assassinated uh, and the et tu brute uh, uh, thing. And then after Julius Caesar was assassinated, his, his nephew Octavius and his friend Mark Antony set out to kill all of those who had been co-conspirators in the assassination of Julius Caesar. And so uh, as they did this, both of them went their separate ways, doing the good work that they had agreed upon doing, and yet each of them began, began to gain power in different parts of the Roman Empire. And uh, Mark Antony, as you know, sort of began to work toward the area that we know of as, as, as the Bible lands and down in toward Egypt, where he had the uh, famous relationship with Cleopatra. And Herod the Great uh, made uh, an alliance and a friendship with Mark Antony and Cleopatra. Now, Octavius, back toward Rome and, and uh, up in uh, Macedonia and in this region, began to, to sort of solidify his power there. And it became uh, obvious to everyone that there was an inevitable uh, civil war coming. And so Herod makes the decision that he's going to bet on the Mark Antony horse to win this race. And unfortunately for Herod, he picked the wrong horse because pretty quickly as, as the battles began to take place, Mark Antony was consistently defeated. And at the decisive battle of Actium, um, Octavius wins in a powerful way. Mark Antony retreats to uh, Egypt where he and Cleopatra famously commit suicide. This leaves Herod now uh, in Judea in quite the, the pickle, as my grandfather used to say. He really seemingly has a couple of choices. One, he could try to hold off and fight and fend off the uh, Octavius as, as long as he could, or he could simply go into hiding, but most likely they're, they're going to find him somewhere. And so he does something that was incredibly brazen. It's almost one of those things like you watch on some kind of a, a movie or TV program. He, he just does the, th the unthinkable, and he, and he sails, and I forget what island Octavius, who I think by this time had been given the title Caesar Augustus by the Roman Senate, he sails to the island where he was at at the time unannounced and unexpected, and basically comes up to the place where he is, knocks on the door, they open the door, and everyone is stunned and shocked to discover that it is Herod who has come to see Octavius. And it's kind of like, what in the world are you doing here? You are an enemy of the state. We're going to find you eventually and deal with you, but you've actually done us the favor of just coming and presenting yourself here. And he comes into the room, and he he, he says, just hear me out, and he delivered a, a speech, and we don't know the details of the speech, but we're told some about it by some uh, reporters, historians, who say that it went something like this. He, he told Octavius, he said, you know that I was a supporter of your enemy, Mark Antony, and that I was loyal to him throughout the Civil War, and that I stayed by his side and was loyal to him all the way down to the bitter end. And what that means, Octavius, and that you can know about me, is that whenever I pledge my allegiance to someone, that I am loyal to them to the very end. And I am here today to tell you that I yield and pledge my allegiance to you as the emperor of Rome. And he was so, Octavius was so taken aback, and everyone in the room was so taken aback with this uh, audacity and boldness of speech and yet compelling speech that they not only didn't take the kingdom of Judea away from Herod, but rather sent him back and enlarged his lands, and ultimately the Senate conferred upon him the title King of the Jews. Herod gave himself the title Herod the Great. So he was king of the Jews, Herod the Great, and as I said a moment ago, he um, 
unfortunately, I think to me, is one of the people that I can identify with in the story of Jesus more than I wish I did. And, and part of that is because I have a tendency in my own life to want to, to preserve, to, to protect, and to control the, the, the narrative of my life. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to make sure that things go the way that I think that they should go. And, and sometimes even willing to, to take a risk in order to see to it that that's going to happen. And Herod was that kind of guy just writ large. He was all about holding on, consolidating his power, conferring his legacy as by the time we come to Matthew chapter 2, he is an elderly man and he is determined to see to it that, the, the, that he controls the, the, the kingdom and the narrative and the um, uh, dynasty which he had begun that it would continue to run through, through his line. And so that's the kind of man he was, preserve, protect, control. And then we find this in Matthew chapter 2 in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, because where else could he be born? He is the descendant of David, and David is of Bethlehem. Where else would David's heir come from but the city of David? But he was Born in, in Judea, and, during, uh, and this happened during the time of King Herod, whom we just described. And during that time, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem with a question. So you can sort of imagine these, these Magi, which we ought to talk about for a moment. These are travelers from the east, it says. Most likely, scholars think, probably from Persia, Babylonia, somewhere out east, and uh, they were known for their astrologers, their wise men, and um, this, I think, gives us some indication of the lasting and enduring influence of men like Daniel or Nehemiah or even Esther and Mordecai that we read about in the Old Testament who lived in that region while Israel was in captivity in Babylon. Because we know that men like Daniel had extensive interaction with the Magi, with the wise men, the counselor. These were, these were the most highly educated counselors to the, to the eastern monarchs in that part of the world. And Daniel had interface and interaction with them throughout the course of his life and undoubtedly had left an impact. And Daniel had told them about a king who would come. And no doubt they had left a deposit of the scriptures with the people of the east, including a prophecy going all the way back to the book of Numbers in which Balaam prophesied that there would be a king rise up out of Judea, out of Judah, rather. And so perhaps with all of this and perhaps other direct revelation from God, these men were seeking the one who had been born in Jerusalem or in Judea somewhere as the king of the Jews. And so they came to Jerusalem, the capital city, and they're wandering about or seeking to find out who's in charge here. And they bring this news that they want to know where or who has been born this king of the Jews, because that's their question. Where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. There is endless speculation about the nature of this star. I don't know exactly what kind of astrological phenomenon this was. I take it to have been miraculous, and so it led them to this particular place. But what I want us to notice here is that these men who had set out on their journey upon, upon seeing this star, connecting it with the Old Testament prophecies of the birth of the son of David, the, the king of Israel, the Messiah, that they wanted to come and yield allegiance and do uh, reverence to this king who is the fulfillment of these prophecies. So it's kind of a, a remarkable thing, and I, I couldn't help but notice as we were singing this morning in the song, I'll Worship the King. Uh, no, no, I got that wrong. That's a, that's a good song, but I'm thinking actually about the scripture that Doug read about uh, the, the um, people coming from where to gather with the people of God, to sit down with the people of God. They come from the east and the west. They come from all over the place. Whereas the people who should have been prepared and ready to receive their king 
find themselves cast out, which is exactly where we're going to see Herod uh, in a few moments. So they come, the people from abroad, who, who come to worship this king, and they bring this news, and one can only imagine the reaction that someone like Herod would have to this news. In fact, we're told that when Herod heard this, that he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Now, another thing that we need to know about Herod is not only was he just ambitious, but he was ruthlessly ambitious. And he was so determined to preserve his power and to control the direction of his legacy that he was willing to kill anyone who he thought would get in the way, including a number of his own sons, including one of his wives, in fact, his favorite wife, the one that they tell us that he actually loved, but was suspicious of her part, perhaps in a conspiracy against him. And so anyone or anything that stood in the way of him being what he wanted to be or doing what he wanted to do or continuing his legacy into the future, he would kill. And so it is understandable that not only was he disturbed by the news, but also that everyone in Jerusalem is disturbed by this news. It is a disturbing thing to a tyrant to hear that there is a rival to the throne. And this is why I said a moment ago that there are many ways in which Herod, unfortunately, I see myself in the story here. And I think that if you're honest, you may find yourself reflected in the life of Herod here as well. That Jesus doesn't come into the world simply to be a king or to have his part in history. He comes to be the Messiah. He comes to be the king. He comes not to take sides, but as someone said, but to to take over and to call upon us to yield absolute allegiance and obedience to him, to acknowledge his rights over me, to say in effect, here I am to do your bidding, whatever you command, I will obey. Now, what is, what are the orders And that was something that Herod was disturbed by. Someone who would interfere with his plans for his life and his purpose. Do you ever feel like there's any resistance in your life between what you want to do and what the Lord Jesus has in mind for you to do? Well, he's disturbed. They're all disturbed with him because when Herod gets disturbed, heads tend to roll And everyone is worked up about this visit from the Magi from the east. And so when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where is the Messiah to be born? He wants to know the answer to the question that they are asking. Where is the Messiah to be born? Of course, Herod should have perhaps known the answer to this question, but he wasn't Uh, I think, too sincere in his religious faith. He had supposedly converted to Judaism, um, but uh, he doesn't know the the prophecies concerning this. So he calls together the chief priests, the teachers who are experts in this kind of thing, and asks them where, where, where would this king, should he be born, be found? And of course, they know the answer in Bethlehem and Judea and Judah. Uh, They replied, for this is what the prophet has written. And then they quote from the Old Testament prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. So Jerusalem finds out that Bethlehem, which is only a few miles down the road, is the place where the one whom the Magi from the east have come, following his star, believing that he has been born and is to be king and ruler of the people of God. So what Herod does next is precisely the kind of move that you would expect from the character Herod. He tells the Magi to to come to him. He he sends everybody else out of the room. Everyone get out except these uh, wise men, these travelers, these foreign dignitaries. He sends everyone else out. He has them brought in and he says, hey, I want to ask you guys a, a question. When exactly did this star appear? 
He wanted to find out precisely the moment that they first saw this star appear that apparently coincided with the birth of this king. And having received this information, it says that he sent them to Bethlehem and said, I want you guys to go and search carefully for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. See, I don't want the word of this to get out for various reasons, but, but I, I've, been, I've been anticipating this as well. I've been looking forward to this as well. I want to worship him just like you. Your, your, your ambitions, your desires, your intentions for this newborn Messiah King fulfillment of great prophecy is in alignment with my own. And, and I want you to do this favor for me. You find them Find him and send word to me so that I can come and join with you in worship. Well, it says that then they uh, heard, when they heard the king, that they went on their way. And the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And that's an understatement in this translation. Apparently, it's almost like a fourfold expression of joy. They were filled with exceedingly great joy is, is, I think, the literal idea. And so I think that one of the things that that shows us is that true worship, which is um, symbolized or being shown us or illustrated to us in the lives of these wise men who have come from the East, is that um, joy upon hearing the good news of Jesus Christ is a part and parcel to a genuine reception of it. But it says that, that then they came into the house. And obviously this is some time has taken place since the, the birth of Jesus. And they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Now this is a kind of a moving and meaningful part of the story to me. Because as I've mentioned before, these men are men of stature. They're men of education. They are the most highly educated people of of the time and from the things that we know about ancient Babylon and the wisdom and learning that they acquired. it 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 was something significant. And they have prestige, and we should not imagine them to just be, you know, however many of them there were. One of the things that we don't know is how many of them there were. There were three gifts that they give, and so it's often assumed that there were three of these wise men, but we don't know. But undoubtedly, they were accompanied because of the value of the treasury that they brought with them, a number of perhaps soldiers and so forth, that this was a significant movement on the part of, of these noble men. And yet when they come to the one that they have received information about as the Messiah King, they set aside their dignity in order that they might bow down and worship him. And bowing down for those in the ancient and perhaps even modern Near East doesn't mean a a curtsy or a little bow like at the waist. It means to prostrate oneself on the ground, head to the ground, to get as low as you can to acknowledge the distinction or the difference between who I am and who the one that I am worshiping is. And to worship, we sometimes think of worshiping as as singing, and singing certainly is an expression of worship, but basically it is the idea of coming into the presence of someone that you hold in reverence, someone that you are awestruck by. And doing both internally and externally whatever is within your power to demonstrate the awe and and honor in which you hold the one that you've come to worship. And so their worship is exuberant. And I think, again, that is something that we ought to note and take note of is the exuberant worship of these men who are being brought into, as it were, this kingdom that Abraham would sit down with from the east and the west, while others who should have been invited will be excluded. And not only do they bow down and worship him, but they then open up their treasures. So they worship with exuberance and they give and sacrifice with extravagance. 
They open up their treasures and present him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And undoubtedly, these gifts of gold would come uh, to be of great value to this poor uh, traveling family who was away from their home uh, by virtue of having to be in Bethlehem for a variety of reasons, which we don't have the time to go into the detail of, but would soon also have to flee their own country and become exiles in Egypt for a period of time. But after this, they make their uh, escape, as it were, from the land to which they had traveled, having been warned, it says in verse 12, in a dream not to go back to Herod. Instead, they returned to their country by another route. So again, they receive some kind of revelation from God that it's not safe to go back to Herod, perhaps for their own sake, but more importantly, for the sake of, of the child. They're warned that Herod's expression of desire to worship this child was deceptive, and so they deceive him and disobey his orders and return another way. Now, we're told that during this time that Jesus' parents, Herod, uh, um, uh, Joseph, and Mary, uh, also take Jesus away because of they, are, uh, they are warned in a dream uh, of what is coming, and they escape to Egypt. But during the time or shortly after they had escaped, this is what happened. It says that when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and the word uh, in Greek for his fury here is the strongest word in their language for this. He was absolutely beside himself and outraged by this. Uh, Herod was not one to trifle with. He was a man who considered himself a man of wit. And when he discovered that he had been outwitted by these foreign uh, visitors and perhaps even by a toddler, he was furious. And the sad thing is, is that when Herod's fury broke out, there was no telling what was going to happen, except that you could be pretty sure somebody was going to die. And in this case, here's what we know. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under. And we might wonder, well, why the year two? And it says it was in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. So remember when he sent everyone else out and he, he secretly asked them when exactly they had first seen the star appear, apparently they had told him it was sometime a little less than two years, and so perhaps he picks the round number two years to make sure that he kills all of the boys in this area in Bethlehem. And from what we know of the population of these villages that surrounded Jerusalem at the time, this probably... Uh, does not exceed 20 or 30 boys, but it would have been devastating to a community and certainly devastating to their parents. And one of the reasons that I like to talk about these kinds of stories around Christmas time is not because I think that December 25th is Jesus' birthday or because I think that we uh, have to do that or, or something of the sort, but because I think that we need to as I started the, the lesson with the idea that Christianity is just sort of like the mythology of, of these other uh, pagan and ancient religions, one of the things that can go with that is we tend to, to turn it into just this story of sweetness and light, and certainly there is great beauty and sweetness in the story of Jesus' birth. But we also need to hear the way that it actually was as the scripture presents it and think about it at this time and in any time of the year rightly and, and understand that the world that Jesus came into was a world that was in desperate need of him coming into it. It was a brutal world. It was a dark world. It was a world where men like Herod, who had the greatest ambition, the greatest political skill and maneuvering, and the boldness and power simply ran over anyone and everyone else, and there was almost nothing that anyone could do to stop them. And so he unleashes his fury 
slaughters these innocent children and perhaps anyone who tried to stand in the way of it happening. It's hard to imagine actually being on the streets of Bethlehem, being one of those parents or being a passers-by as on that morning when the soldiers arrived and wondered what was going on and then begin to hear the screams and the weeping in the streets that must have gone on for days. You know, it wasn't long after this then that Jesus was brought back up out of Egypt by Mary and uh, Joseph, and they settled up north of this area in Nazareth. But it also wasn't long after this story when Herod died. He was an older man when this began, and he only lived perhaps another year or two at the most after this event took place. And I kind of wonder what it would have been like if someone could have sat on his deathbed with him in his pain, because apparently he died of excruciatingly painful kidney disorder, and and sat on the edge of his bed and said, Herod, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is that 2,000 years from now, people all over the world are still going to know your name. I mean, you are literally going to go down in history. And Herod say, well, that is good news. I'm glad to hear that. That's kind of in keeping with my ambition uh, of the glory of my name. And so what's the bad news? The bad news is, well, you know that little boy that you tried to exterminate, apparently ineffectually, well, your story and the reason that you're going to be remembered for thousands of years into the future is because you're going to be a footnote in the story of this Jesus of Nazareth. And you know, Herod, all these magnificent things that you have accomplished, all the building that you have done, yeah, there's going to be historians that are going to take notice of the fact that you built Caesarea Maritima, that you built Masada, that you built this great temple, but you know, within 70, 75, 70 years from now, that temple is going to be just scraped off of the Temple Mount as if it had never been there. The thing that you spent almost all your life building up in order to enhance the glory of your name and your standing among the Jews, it's going to be utterly, utterly decimated. And it's not going to be your building projects that remember. You're not going to be known in the books of history as Herod the Builder, but you're going to be remembered as Herod the Butcher. And the saddest part about it, Herod, is that you were only about five miles away to go and do what other wise men did, and that is bow down and worship the king. You know, about 75 years after all of this, after Herod's death, after Jesus had died and been resurrected and ascended to the Father's right hand, after Jerusalem had been destroyed and the temple had been wiped out, the Apostle John, who at the crucifixion of Jesus took Mary, Jesus' mother, into his own home, wrote um, a biography about his best friend, Jesus. Because he was about to reach the end of his life and people needed to know his particular insights into the life and times of Jesus the Messiah. And of all the things he wrote, one of the things that really strikes me is something found in chapter 1 beginning in verse 14, verse 4 rather, where it says, speaking of Jesus, that in him was life. He came into the world where there was death everywhere, where people died young, where people died in brutal wars and murder. But in him was life. And that life, it was like a light. And his life was not just like a light for us Jews or the few disciples that followed him. It was a light that was so bright 
that it was seen in the east, and from his birth, men came to worship him in his toddlerhood. And he, as he grew up, that light just grew brighter and brighter, and everywhere he went, it was like he was the light of the world. In him was life, in him was light, and it was a light for all mankind. And then John does something interesting, because both of those are in the past tense. He was life. He was light. But then he switches to the present tense to have something, I think, to say to you and me here this morning. That light shines. That light hasn't gone out. That life and life-giving power hasn't ceased. It's still a light that shines in the darkness. Because too often the world still is a dark place. I, I think it is much, much, much better than perhaps we can imagine better than it was then. But as we know, there can still be a lot of darkness in life. And there can still be a lot of darkness in us. But one thing about coming to grips with the true story of Jesus and seeing him for who he truly was is that we have in all of the darkness and all the pain and all the misery and all the suffering and all the injustice and all the problems that we may experience as we go through our lives, as we, there, there is still a light shining in the darkness. And no matter how bad it gets, even to this day, 2,000 years later, the darkness has not prevailed against it, has not been able to put it out. The light that Jesus lit is a light that still guides those who are willing to look, who are willing to seek and bow down in worship and reverence and open the treasury of their life to give extravagantly to him not only our possessions but our very selves. And you know, one of the days, these days very soon, just like Herod, we're going to pull our feet up into the bed for the last time. And someone's going to tell the story of our life, just like we've told the story of Herod's life. And I think that the defining thing about your life and my life is not going to be our accomplishments, the degrees that we earned, the businesses that we built, the money that we saved and spent. The question is going to be all about whether we resisted or we worshiped the king. And this morning, if there's been darkness in your life and you see in Jesus the light that you need to become the guiding principle to govern your travels till this life is over, to give your life relevance and ultimately meaning, then we encourage you to come and do as these wise men long ago did and bow down in reverence and honor and worship him. This great king has made it possible for you to be united with him through faith and repentance. And through baptism, you can have your sins washed away and he will enter into your life and be that guiding light that will lead you all the way home to the Father's house. If we can encourage you this morning to do that, we will do so while we stand and while we sing.